Happy Easter. And anyone who's watching us online this morning, my name is Carol Sheffield. I'm reading this morning. And that fog is clearing. Since I was going into my mental fog, it's been clearing from studying in the third book for a day at a time. The more fog is clearing for who? Day at a time. It is actually, yes, it's clearing us now, right? This morning we are very blessed to have Reverend Jen Maher with us this morning. <laughs>
and now we are so blessed to have Nancy Moulton come to sing for us. Our ministry ministry, let's give him a hand. Sundays since I've been with you, 
talking about the law of attraction. It's been a subject I've addressed many times in different ways. And how that law is impacting your life every single moment that you're Indeed, now that you think about this, if you look at your life, it is merely an up picture of the law of attraction that you're having going on in your mind. Your outward life is just an outward picture of what's going on up here. If you've been in unity for a long time, and most of you have, you have probably read and studied the law of attraction many, many times. I certainly have. Back in my years with Jack Bowen, when I was going to that church and working there for a while, uh, it was just something we talked about constantly. Because the law of attraction is a basic, very fundamental, in some ways almost the fundamental law of how this world works. And isn't that what you want to know? How this world works? How you get along in it? It seems to me, and I may be wrong, that unity doesn't give quite the emphasis to the law of attraction that it did in past years. I'm not sure if I'm right about that. But it's so fundamental. We need to really keep in mind what is happening when we talk about that law. So what is the law in its most basic thing? The law says this, that you, that me, that all of us are creating our experiences that we're responsible for our day-to-day -day life. In other words, nobody's doing it to us. We're doing it to ourselves. That's not real comfortable, is it? Actually, I saw a shift even as I said that. I looked in the room and sort of... <laughs> okay, I think I can go home now. Or maybe the coffee's ready out there. We don't realize that. But if we do, it would be tremendous. I want to tell it to you as the Course in Miracles says it. If what I just said seemed troublesome, hear what the Course in Miracles spends a great deal of time talking about. I am responsible for everything that happens to me. Whoa! I am responsible for everything that happens to me. And I receive exactly as I have asked. That made you feel comfortable. Give me a huge smile. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, all the stuff that I'm responsible for. My little tender bender, my bad experience at the store, everything else, my 15th love affair that's gone down the tube. I'm responsible. None of us want to hear such a thing. We're going to get into it much more fully. But if you can hear and apply and know how this law works, it's your ticket to freedom. Because if you've been having the bad stuff, you got the ticket for the good stuff. So I want you to think about it that way, to go on that side of it. A little more exactly what, how the law works, and as Phil Moore talked about it, is that whatever we hold in our mind, hold in our mind, especially whatever we give our feeling nature to, on a consistent level, will somehow manifest in our experience. Now, if it's good and wonderful and magnificent and your life is great, you can say, I'm taking credit for this. I'm responsible for this. Isn't that great? Look how special I am. But then, if it's awful and your life is falling apart, you want to say, oh, I'm responsible for this. No, it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> That's a real thing of the human condition. If it's not good, it's never my fault. We learned that as little kids. We do something to spill the milk, and mom comes in and says, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. The dog did it, right? We live that way. So we have a whole list of people and things that we blame. The government's at fault. My doctor's always wrong. The neighbors next door are terrible. The list goes on and on and on. Good? Yes, I did that bad. Somebody else did it to me. And you just got to accept that reality. And a lot of us want to kind of, when we're in bad stuff, cry out like Job does in the Bible. Famous line in the Bible, really important one to have in your, in your arsenal of stuff. Job says, I bet you can say it with me, 
Ah, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. The thing I feared the most, there's so much power in that phrase, that word fear, the thing I fear the most has come upon me. And that's something I want you to think about. That what we think about, and talk about, and give our feeling nature to, is almost definitely going to to come somehow into your life. Now, I do want to kind of explain this. I've really thought a lot about this. I've prayed a lot and meditated about this sermon. Does it mean I think about a banana at 2 o'clock and by the end of the day I'll go get a banana? It really isn't that kind of thinking. I don't want you trying to find a little thing for everything. But the general tone of your thinking and what you're holding in your mind is going to manifest in many, many ways. In other words, if your general thinking is, life is good, life is wonderful, I'm a child of God, I'm blessed, and all of that, then your life is going to reflect that in all the little ways, and you'll get a better banana when you go. All right? But if your general tone is, I'm a victim, my parents never treated me well, the world is out to get me and all of that, then your life is just never going to work. It's just not going to work. So I want you to think of those two big broad categories. But also, there are some things that will be almost exact, where the thinking brings on something exactly that reflects it. So the law really is working all the time for us in different ways. And the universe will quickly respond to what you're thinking by putting things right into your field of experience. Now before I go on, I want to use a couple of things we talked about last month. Number one, this world is not what it's all about. We think all of our life experiences here. You were alive from the beginning. Your spirit has been around since God said, you're it. Since he loved you, created you. You've been alive. This classroom that we're in, this world that we're living through that seems so important is just a high order of your total life experience. Although it seems really important to us now because we're in it and we're living it. But you've been alive for billions, perhaps billions of years. Your spirit has been. And God has promised your spirit will never die. You always will be. That kind of puts a little different emphasis on the day-to-day -day stuff on earth, doesn't it? And this room, this this room, I don't mean to say this room, this world is just a classroom where we're living and learning. When we thought we separated from God, when we had what the church calls the fall, our decision to forget God. God said, I can't let you do that. I love you too much. You can forget me. You don't have to have anything to do with me. But I will never let you out of my being. You always will be. You always will be with me. And I'm going to help you get over this idea that you're separated by letting you have a classroom, your life on earth, where you will spend your time remembering who you are. That's your whole purpose. Your whole purpose is not to make a billion dollars, or live in the biggest house in the suburbs, or to be the president of the United States. Your job here on earth is to remember who you are. That other stuff can happen with it, but keep in mind of what it's all about. Am I remembering who I am? Am I remembering that God created me just like Himself? I'm what He is, all that He can do. So, first of all, Get that in your mind. That's all this world is for. But it's also a joyous learning. It should be a joyous learning. God put a plan into place then when we thought we separated. Of course, the miracles uses the term the plan of atonement. A lot of people like to use the word atonement as at one moment, of being one with God. And this plan says, God says, I'll let you take all the time you want, you can play around in that classroom, and all you want, but you're going to be able to remember who you are. That's all you want. Now, the major tool 
the classroom book for this class is called the Law of Attraction. Because you will learn, as you learn the Law of Attraction, that you control your life here. And one of the things God wants you to know most of all is that you're a creator just as he is. If God said, let there be light, and there was what? Light. Let there be land and seas, and there was land and seas. You have that same ability. Do you realize that? Can you believe that about yourself? That deep down in you at the deepest levels, your word creates your world. That's spirit, isn't it? Actually, it's a little bit scary, but it's true. You can create just as God created. And you're actually doing that all the time. Because you're creating where you are and what you're doing right now. But you want to learn to create health and vitality, a world of peace and beauty. That's what you want. You want to use your power in such a way that your life becomes more and more wonderful and that you make the world more and more wonderful. And you can do it. You can. The law of attraction is how you do it. The law of attraction teaches us that we're in charge of our lives. We're the ones who are in charge. Our mind is sending out a signal to the universe unending, 24 hours a day, all year long, all time long, that you are in charge of the world. Now, our ego minds, that mind that we made ourselves and we separated, so, oh no, the power's in the government, the power's in, in the mayor, the power's only in the hands of the rich, the power's here, the power's there, it's in medicine, it's in banking, it's not. We've made a magical list of things to blame, but it's all within us. I mentioned in that letter, in the email blast, about a book, why bad stuff happens to good people. How many of you remember that book? Yeah, it was very popular for a while. And I couldn't wait to get it because I wanted the answer. Why do all these good people I know have bad problems? I used to also wonder in the opposite though. Why do bad people have so much good stuff happen to them? <laughs> have you ever thought that way? That guy is lousy. He beats his dog, but he won the lottery. And here I am, the perfect wonderful person and I'm like a five dollar scratch off. <laughs> we do think that way. So why does that happen? The Bible happens to give us a hint in that it says that God's rain, the sun, shines on the good and the evil alike. God doesn't play favorites. So just because you're going to church every Sunday and you promise you're going to give a ten thousand dollar check when you win the big five hundred million dollar lotto, God is not going to pay attention to that. We kind of wish He would, but He doesn't. It may be a bad person, bad as we would term, who will win that money and we just can't understand it. You all know what I'm talking about. I don't have to be talking here today. So. Why does bad stuff happen to us then? Why does it? What's going on inside us that creates this? Is because good people, somewhere in their mind, hold some bad stuff. And on the reverse, is because bad people, somewhere in their minds, hold some good stuff. And which one are you going to give your energy to? Which one? And that bad stuff that some of your experience may come from your tiny child and you can't remember it at all. It might come from a previous lifetime. And I'm going to better from with you. I totally believe in reincarnation. And we carry over things. Because you've been the same spirit. Have you thought about this? Maybe thousands of times incarnating? I mean, I mean, I'm just curious. No, I'm not going to ask that question. I was just curious in a way how many of you believe in reincarnation? You want to put your hand there? Okay, the majority of you do. I'm convinced of it. I have many reasons that I'm convinced of it. Because I see it only as like 
when we went to school, we were in kindergarten and first grade. Um, then our lives, one was kindergarten, one was first grade, and whatever. And because you're in Unity Day, listening to me, you're in college. <laughs> <laughs> How arrogant can I be? <laughs> but you see what I mean? We're moving through. Our lifetimes just allow us time after time to correct what went wrong before. And all the time, God is watching and waiting. Now, what I really want to get into is bad stuff happening to us. He said, well, if I can't remember when I had those thoughts, if I don't know what's going on, how can I do anything about them? But you have a perfect teacher. That's what the universe is for. The universe reflects back to you, and we've talked about this so many times, things that give you feedback. The universe tells you where you're going wrong. I want to let that sink in for just a second. The universe goes right in your face your wrong thinking. And you can either get all upset and blame everything, or you can say, well, thank you for telling me that. Now I can do something about it. If your life goes wrong in any way, and mine does too, just like yours do, I'm not any different than you, I have to listen. When something seems to happen to me that's wrong, I have to examine it, spend time with it. And the spiritual life requires a lot of attention. If you're living a spiritual life, you've got to pay a lot of attention to what is going on. What core beliefs that you have that is causing this to happen. As I said earlier in the sermon, the good stuff is easier. So you can think, I've been a good person, I do my best, I'm loving, I'm kind. It's not unusual then that I have a loving, kind life back. But what about those negative things? What is the universe trying to tell you as it unfolds in front of you? I'm going to give you an example that will seem silly to you, but it's something that I learned about myself, and learning in a small example helps me to be better at the big examples. I love corn on top. I absolutely love it. I love the taste of it. I love seeing the butter just roll off it. <laughs> sea salt, good black pepper. Oh man, what a great thing. But for a long time, I could never eat corn without getting ill. One piece of corn on the top, and I was sick for days. And I couldn't quite understand that. This is a true story, I'm not embellishing it in the least. Because it was an example that God helped me to learn things by. So I would think I'd go to someone's home and have corn on the cob, and it was like I don't want to be rude. I'm sitting there dying to have it, you know, but I can't. And I really began to think about it. I even asked my doctor, why does corn on the cob bother me? And it and corn like from a can or something doesn't. So I really began to just meditate on corn on the cob. I would take my little meditation time in the morning, make corn on the cob. It did about I'm being serious. I'm being real serious. And suddenly I heard my mother's voice as clear as a bell as if she were in the room saying, Betty Wayne, that's what she called me, Betty Wayne. Uh, <laughs> Betty Wayne, don't you need all that corn? Because we need it for other people in the house. I heard that. We need it for other people. And suddenly I had a vision and a total remembrance of back in the farmhouse, of being about four years old, and a big platter of corn on the cob, and I just wanted all of them. And there were many people, like farmhands, who needed to eat. And my mother was telling me, don't take the corn. Don't take the corn that way. It'll make you sick, is what she said. If she would have said to me, uh, and we all do this, I, like Doug and Wayne said, if she would have said, you need to leave it for other people, it would have been different. But when she said, in those little four-year-old ears of mine, 
That will make you sick. I believe it fully. Can you follow that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. And we all are like that. And only then when I said, Mom, I wasn't going to take off the corn. This is a, this has been the adult talk. I'm not Betty Wayne anymore. <laughs> this has been saying, Mom, and, and she's in heaven. You know, I wasn't going to take the corn to be selfish. I just wanted to taste it. And she and I worked it out. And you can work it out with people. It doesn't matter if they've gone years and years and years. Uh, they're hanging around, wanting to work things out. And corn on the cob suddenly has never bothered me again. Never. Never. I can eat four or five of them. <laughs> if I had corn on the cob, I used to go like Nora State. I'll just eat corn on the cob. But I, I'm sure you get my point. Some little something back when I was 40 years old in a farmhouse in Kentucky has followed me for years into my adult life. So what about when we're told, you're too fat, you're not good enough, you're stupid, you can't do anything right. Those thoughts that we accept become this persona, this thing in us that directs and brings all kinds of stuff. I can't do anything, I've had some more than one person say to me, both when I was working in schools and as a minister, I can't seem to ever do anything right. I fail at everything. My whole life is a failure. And when we are able to get into it more, more deeply, they'll remember being told, you don't do anything right. And that becomes a core belief that attracts them things that you will fail at. Oh, it's so important to me that you get the gist of because I want it to be good for you. I want your life to be so good for you. And this is what the universe does then. It gives us ways to say what's wrong. And as I said, with the good things, it's easier to know where the mind works. With bad things, we want to avoid them. We don't necessarily want to know them. So if you want to know, first of all, you have to know this. You've got to give it serious thought. You need to think about it. Something's happening to you over and over and over. Look for the, the thread and then think. Take time to think. And ask spirit to help you. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you journal. I so believe in keeping a journal. Not a diary. A lot of people confuse the two. Don't you want to book where you're writing down my head peas and corn for, for lunch today. It, that, doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's a diary where you, or a journal where you're putting your feelings and allow them to speak back to you. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you do spiritual journaling. Are you familiar with spiritual journaling rather than just journaling? It's a whole different experience. Have we ever had a class at church on how to do that? You, you know? It's a different thing. Because you, you write in your journal from, from where you are now, you even write in your journal where you'll be 50 years from now, looking back. And there's a way to do that. Or to write in your journal what was happening the day you were born that affected your birth. Should we do a class in that maybe? Yeah. 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 It, can, it can reveal so much to you. It's overwhelming the information you will get. I'll, I'll talk with Linda about that, see if we can do like a, a four-week session or something. Because it will bring to you all that stuff that will help you to understand what you're doing. So, God says the universe will tell you where you're going wrong. So you have a way to correct. Because then you can begin to examine your thoughts, modify all the fears and beliefs Whatever it is that causes you to attract what you're getting in your life, you can get a handle on. And when you do, you'll find that one tiny step can change everything. You don't have to think about everything changing at one time. Your thoughts are building, uh, here's a destination, we'll call it. And you're, you're down to your thinking. And you get a certain train of thoughts. I never do anything right. That's not part of my vision. 
And that means that the next thing you do, you don't do it right. And the next thing you do, you do it even worse. And the next one is, it's like a straight line to a destination of being an unsuccessful person. Yet that is a lie. But here at the base, that very first one, I never do anything right. If you just do something from learning about yourself that says, I did that okay today, just that much, click, you start in a new direction. I did that right, and tomorrow I do two things right. And now you're on a, a different track. You're on a track to a star, to, to life in its fullness. Not often, some unsuccessful thing. Just one little step. That's why like, if you're feeling ill, if you're sick, if you will say all day long and call all of your friends and everybody else and say, I'm really sick, I'm really having a terrible, terrible day. Did you hear me? You know that I'm sick today. Yeah. Did I tell you that I'm not feeling well today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know that. And then the mailman comes to the door of the Amazon person and they say, Good morning, did you hear your package? You say, Okay, I'm feeling so sick today. I don't feel well. You know, and just waiting for somebody calling so I can tell them I don't feel good today. And then you finally call them so you can tell them. You know what I'm saying. I'm trying to be funny because you know what I'm saying. You just revel in your sickness. And what do you get then? More sickness. Absolutely. But find one little place you can say, I didn't feel good this morning, but I'm feeling just a little bit better right now. You've changed the whole direction of your life. The whole direction of that experience by making one tiny change of mind. Jesus used the word, what has unfortunately become really misused, uh, the, the Arabic word for repent. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the Catholics have really run with a muffle of that. And the American religious right, and I know that I'm on dangerous ground talking about this in church. <clears throat> yeah, it's made it even worse. Because repent means like you're supposed to say, oh, it's my fault. <laughs> it's my fault. Me a cup of me a cup of me a cup. Did any of you grow up with that? My fault. It's my fault for being alive. Dear God, I'm sorry I'm alive. I tell my family I apologize I was born. This is really typical for so many people. But that's not what Jesus said at all. He's, what he said, if we read the tra translation correctly, is change your mind. Repent means change your mind. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is joy and happiness. So repent for the kingdom of heaven. Then becomes, if we know our dear loving brother Jesus said, change your mind so you can be happy. Let God into your life. Let God into your life. It's a much better thing, isn't it? You may have to, when you examine, change your fundamental beliefs. You may have to sit down and talk to yourself to no end. But one step at a time, you can change what's happening in your world. So, at the end of today, take time. What was happy and good for you today? And that you'd like more of? And think, how do I myself believe Ben? If Ben could possibly be right, and he might be probably isn't, but if he could possibly be right, then it means that I kind of make this happy day for myself. How did I do it? Or it's been a miserable day, and Ben is right, turn in. If he is, how did I do that? What am I believing? Why do I never have enough money? Why do I never have a happy love in there? Why do I never get good neighbors? Why? Why? I was at a dinner party last night with three unity ministers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love them dearly. But when we're all together, it just gets to be too much, you know? <laughs> what are you thinking about eating that? Well, I'm thinking I'm going to like it. Well, do you ever think about what it would be like if it didn't have it? Let me eat. It's like, we're awesome. Really, it's like when any group of people 
people get together and eat too much or something, right? And the table is got a little crazy last night, the three of us, but good, good souls that I love dearly. And I lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> quite honest. I just want you to have a happy life and to realize that you can make it happier and more abundant and more loving and more wonderful in every way by watching what you're thinking. Watch what you share with people on the phone. Are you quick to find people that you can complain to? Are you doing that? I did it to myself in just this week. I had a bad experience in an era on a Masonic pressure. It was really a, an unpleasant experience. And I couldn't wait to tell everyone about it. <laughs> I did. I, 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 my next door neighbor, the 86 year old lady, just says, Morning, Ben. And I was like, You know what? I'm so upset. Because I got the wrong order of Panera and then it had a lot. Of, and then I've had since then three or four bad experiences at Panera. And it's like, When will I learn? When will I learn? You know? Okay, bless that 16 year old at Panera who doesn't know how to do the job yet. Do I have to let that break right my life? Do I? It's all here. No, it's actually here. You know why I do that? Your mind isn't where your brain is. That's another discussion someday. But if you think your mind is right here, no. That's where your computer is that runs everything. But the mind that thinks is outside you. Because it's thinking. It's just thinking you. I see that look go right across your face. Talk over that. Okay, okay, I will. I just want you though to be happy. That's true, and that's the only reason I'm here. I want you to be happy. To live as a child of God should live. To be wondrous in everything you do, to be prosperous. Have a great relationship, to have super, super health and vitality. I want that for all of us. I want you to live that way. And I know sometimes I get a little silly and carried away, but this is you get my point. The whole point of today is this you create your life by your thinking, and you can change it by taking charge of your thinking, and you'll know where you're going wrong because the universe will tell you. And by the way, there's a sure test for knowing that you're doing it right. There's a sure test for knowing it. It's how you feel inside. The universe gives us that feedback. You did it right. Do you feel good? Yeah, I do. That's the test. If you feel really bad and wrong, then you're failing. You're not doing it right. So do it by trial and error. But take time. Are you not worth giving an hour's thought to a day? Answer that. Is your life not worth taking time to meditate? Is your life not worth examining fully? As a man thinketh, so he is. One of the great, great books of your thought. As you think, give yourself time for yourself for your mind, for your soul, for your body, and be here for the world, and be better for all of us. Do it. Take time for you. Take time for your soul. Maybe you don't need to be on Facebook quite so long. Maybe the computer can get close and you can go to the great computer within you for a little while. It's a noisy world. It's a busy world. We all need to retreat and examine ourselves. I encourage you to do that. I love you, friends. I love you. So let's practice this just a little bit. So let's get ready for some meditation. Feet flat on the floor if you're comfortable, because that really does help ground you. Kind of keeps you attached to reality and or the earth of God. Hands under your lap, if comfortable. 
you can be very effective to open them, palms up, but if that's uncomfortable, don't worry about it. I'm going to do a very simple breathing in of God, breathing out of our ego selves. We don't need to say all of that, we just need to know that that's what we're doing. So with me, breathe in God, through your nose, the fullness of God's being, and breathe out the ego. Breathe in God. Breathe in God. Breathe out of ego. Bring it, breathing in all the goodness and wonder and joy of life. Breathing out the pain and the sorrow and the mistaken thoughts. Breathing in God. As that thought comes to you, 
are you willing to change your mind about the other one and take this thought instead? Can you say, I've outgrown that lonely thought? I am now ready to embrace this new thought. Just simply a yes or a no. Or in this brief time that we meditate together, you just want to uncover one thing that limits your life. And make the decision if you'll accept a correction. Take that deep within yourself, deep into your feeling nature, into your heart chakra. Let it rest there. And know that if you do that throughout this day, perhaps in your sleep and your dreams, or tomorrow, the universe will supply you with some word something to show you that you're willing to change direction. You may hear it in the song. I don't know what you're reading. Suddenly you'll have a message pop right out. It's not just for you. A friend may call on the phone and say something that doesn't seem related. You know you've experienced things like this before. Now you want to make it part of your daily life, daily routine. To listen to the universe. And the message you want to hear above all is, you are my
you treasure happiness more than you treasure your problems? As we sing the Lord's Prayer, let the words resonate within your soul. Think about what the words say about who you are. The Lord's Prayer.
and realize money is only a thought, abundance is only a thought, everything of this world is only a thought. And you can have many, many, many thoughts about something. You can increase it, increase everything in your mind. So hold it, just think for a second. Hmm. This is a thought about what I think abundance is. It's just a thought. And then when you get to God, get with the thought that it will be used properly to help you to help the world. Together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, and all that I receive. Amen. Well, good morning all. And as you all know, tomorrow is Halloween. And I just thought that maybe we can have a little fun with that. And uh, um, well, tomorrow, maybe for me, we'll have to enjoy the presence of such lovely characters as Goblins and Birds and Monsters and Witches and their best friends. Black cats. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, this black cat sometimes gets long and lonely, and so that's why it brings his friends from 1960s, and namely dark, that dark cat, uh, blue cat, and a cat. So here they are.
morning. You can stand, he's getting, okay. I'll welcome all family this morning. And before I forget, we are having our annual membership meeting before fellowship. So take a break after the service, use the bathroom, get water, whatever. Come stop at the round table, get your paperwork, and then come right back in here for our membership meeting, and then fellowship will follow that. Okay? All right. So we effective prayer for today's times is a Zoom class with Reverend Anita Cope. You will get codes for that online, right? And we sent it to you. And they're, it's Friday, November 11th and 18th. That's coming up. See Reverend Anita, too, when, when she's here, she won't answer any questions about that. Thanksgiving potluck, Sunday, November 20th. Sign up at the book corner to attend and bring a side dish. Or bring a side dish, but you can come without bringing a dish, just so you know. And church decorating and lunch. We're trying to one get this set by the time. It's so much fun. Friday, November 25th. Sign up at the book corner for that. We have, oh, the beautiful tree goes right there. That's really a fun day. We have food also that day. And I'm going down to that. November, December, daily words are in the book corner for sale. Snacks and goodies are really appreciated for fellowship at your service. There's a sign-up sheet for that in the book corner. And there's also a notice about breaking on the bottom shelf where the clipboards are explaining the upcoming schedule starting in 23. Information about that. So, oh, I'm coming. Is this Thursday? And if you ever want to come, please let me in here. I know because we have lower grounds we can bring you. One o'clock, we go back to once a month, one o'clock on Thursdays. We welcome everyone that wants to try it. Just let us know so we can bring you a drum. And I do have one funny compliments of T. Edwards. I love it. When I was younger, I would drop something and pick it up. Now that I'm older, I drop something, look down and say, do I really need them? <laughs> Alright, let's all circle up on the, oh, oh, we've got to add something, yes. Um, when I drop something on the floor, yeah. I can go over and pick it up and say, oh, this is part of my exercise program. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's more than you thinking. Do you want to pass it? Yes.
and what you're thinking and what you're doing so that it can be better. You're really worth doing it for. You're really worth doing it for. I love you, friends. God bless you. Let's have a great week together. The love of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us.